Let's go. Howdy, everybody. My name is John Williamson. I'm an engineer by trade, going to seminary at DTS right now, and I'm a, a head, head counselor at Camp Arete. I'm a jail chaplain at Harris County Jail downtown. I teach the kids here, at, uh, the teenagers here at uh, West Houston Bible Church. And since Robbie is off in Tucson, going to Tucson Bible Church and going to go to APAC after that, I'm here on uh, this uh, today and on next Tuesday teaching more about Jonah. We're going to have a good old time doing that. But we got a couple announcements. We got uh, we need to pray for Robbie as he's going to be traveling, bringing him back to us safely. We also need to we got our church picnic is April 13th at Orlando Salas's place. It's been like three years since we've actually had one, so let's pray for for sunshine and we can have a good old time doing that. I think that's all the announcements. So we always have to start with prayer if we're going to deal with God's word. We need God's spirit with us, and He does. He's not going to be with us if he regards iniquity in our hearts. So we got to use 1 John 1, 9 and confess our sins, right? So I'll give you a couple of moments for silent prayer, and then we'll open in prayer. Let's start. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together and learn about you, study your word, and uh, learn about the study the resurrection of your Son who gives us life. I pray you will bless us this day. Bless me as I try to teach your word and Teach about the ultimate blessing that it comes from your son. Pray for Robbie. He's traveling around. Help him to be safe. Help him to have a great teach well at Tucson and to have a great time over there in, at APAC. I pray for this country. Strengthen our president. Help him make wise decisions. And help us as a congregation, as individuals, to love you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, to obey you, and to be ministers, ministers of the gospel until your son returns to save us from this present evil age. In the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, in whom lies all of our hope, amen. So in the last, earlier I've been going through Jonah. I have went through the story of it, the basics of the story, uh, my first lesson, and then I went and talked more about some particular details last time. I'm going to review that very quickly as I go through it, particularly some of the nice Assyrian atrocities. I like those pictures. I always get excited when we have neat archaeological evidence, so I'll try to go through that pretty fast. I went and covered it in more detail earlier. After that, we're going to jump to the New Testament. We're going to do some, have a tour of the Bible a little bit, maybe practice your sword drills because we're going to be moving around a bit. But here's my, my outline. We're going to be looking at the, there's one major reference to Jonah in the New Testament. And that's what Jesus is talking about, that no sign will be given to this generation but the sign of Jonah. So we'll look at that. We're going to ask, figure out what is the sign of Jonah. I think it's not that hard, but we're, we got That's one of the questions we've got to answer if we're going to do this logically and method, method, in order. And we've got to say, what is the purpose of the sign of Jonah? What's Jesus talking about? Why is he saying it? What is his reason for giving that? And what does the sign mean for us? Because ultimately, the, it's really good to know the Bible. It's good to know who, people, places, things, dates. I love it. It's one of my favorite things ever. But we've got to eventually be able to come to the point where how does that affect me? How does it affect my life? How do I use this? How do I deal with it, use this when dealing with other people? And sometimes it's a, it's a short, you don't have to go very far for that. Sometimes it's, it's easy to get to make that jump, and other times it takes a bit longer. It's a bit more involved. This one won't be that, that hard, but we'll get there. And finally, we'll, uh, hopefully I'll have some time at the end for questions and I would love it if you guys had questions. I, there's nothing more I like when teaching Bible than having discussion. So if you've got questions, you, I prom, anytime you've got a question, raise your hand, and I promise I'll get it to you. We'll talk about it. Does it sound good to you? Good, good. So first, we're going to run through a review. So here's the story of Jonah. we got God's word came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. But Jonah, he got up but went the other way. Let's see, I got a picture of it going the other way. There, he got, he got up and went the other way. Instead of going to Nineveh, he went to Tarshish, which is about the, as far away as you could go. And as he went, went the other way, he went down to Joppa, modern-day Tel Aviv, and got in a ship and started sailing east, and then God threw a storm at him, and it raged, and he, all the sailors were praying to their gods because they're worried they're going to die. But Jonah, he didn't bother him at all. He just went below decks, and he fell asleep. And the, the captain came down and said, what are you doing, Jonah? What's going on? Who are you? Why aren't you worried? Pray to your God. And he says, a Hebrew I am, and the God who made the earth and the dry land I serve. 
So they cast, they cast lots to figure out why this was happening to him and came upon Jonah, and they asked him all these questions again, and he said, and they told him he's running from God. And they threw they were, they were apoplectic. They were crazy. You, you did what? We're going to die because of you. What do we do? And he told them, throw me overboard, and you'll live. And the, and the sailors are like, nah, that doesn't sound right. I don't want This guy said he's a prophet of the God who made the sea and the land. Man, if we kill this prophet, he'll be even more mad at us. So they row, they row with all their might to try to get to land, and then the storm stops raging against Jonah. Now it's raging against the sailors because they've disobeyed the word of the Lord. And they, and they can't get it. The ship's about to sink. So they say that his blood's not on us, and they grab him, and they throw him overboard. And the storm stops, and they worship and praise God and make sacrifices and vows in his name. Then Jonah sinks to the bottom of the sea, is swallowed by a fish, says, I, I, don't keep, I keep my vows unlike those who have no faithfulness, like those sailors who vowed that they were going to make vows in his name. But Jonah says he's going to keep his vows. But, and then the, the, ship, the, the fish goes and spew, vomits him up on the shore. And, jo- and God again comes to Jonah and says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. And this time, this time, Jonah gets up and arises and goes to the city, and he cries against it says, he t- says that judgment's coming. You better repent. Well, Nineveh repents. They start. They believed. The, they believed the word of the Lord. They started. Uh, they, they put sack, sackcloth and ashes on. Or uh, on. They, they were putting on putting that sackcloth on cows. But they believed God, and God relented of the judgment he he had. He forgave them, and Jonah wasn't very happy about that. So he got mad with God. Went out east of the city, built a shelter, then. To see what, so maybe God's not serious about this. Maybe He will actually crush these people. Well, then God made a plant grow up to uh, shade, to give him shade, and Jonah he loved that plant, loved it a lot. It was a really nice plant. But then the next day, God appointed the worm. It's my favorite worm in the Bible. God appointed this worm. This worm had a mission, and the worm did its job well. It attacked the plant, and the plant withered. And then God appointed a scorching east wind to come over the desert and discomfort Jonah. And Jonah was mad to the point of death, he said, over, the, over the, the plant. And he said, God asked him, you have a right to be angry? He says, I've got an angry reason to be angry even to the point of death. Even the point of death. I mean, it's pretty angry, right? Pretty angry. But then God said, you don't, you don't have compassion on, I mean, you didn't work for the plant, but you're mad about it. It's not yours, it's mine. But and you, don't have, you have compassion on the plant, but why don't you have compassion on, the, on Nineveh, the great city that's got 120,000 people that don't know right from wrong. And we're left hanging. We're left hanging we're at the end. And that's the story of Jonah. Now, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, Dr. McGinnis may have a, had a great presentation on Jonah at the recent conference. I'd encourage you all guys, all go watch that. McGinnis knows his narrative literature pretty well. But, so that's the story. Now, most people encounter Jonah. They know the story. The, the most famous thing about Jonah is the big old fish. But in the New Testament, we encounter Jonah with what, something that Jesus says. Let's see. Actually, let's go, let's go talk about... No, I'm going I'm to skip through the... It, the, the Ninevites were bad people. You see they have a, a, a bunch of heads on pikes here. This is on the, the gates, their door to the palace. So whenever you went to go see the Ninevite king, you'd, go, you'd look at these gates... And you'd see, oh man, if, we, if I make him mad, he might uh, cut off all of our heads and make a, you know, pillars out of it. And he, he talked about killing people and taking their skin off. You see, you see pictures here of, uh, on, this, on the bronze doors going to the, the palace of someone being impaled. And you notice they don't have any hands or feet. They've been cut off. And right here, there's, a, there's a, an Assyrian soldier cutting off someone's hand. These are, the, these are unpleasant people. They're people that make ISIS look like they're, like they're Girl Scouts. So just this, this, oh, and by the way, the, the city's on fire. If you see this, the, the flames here and you see that there's heads on the, you know, mounted on the, on the city. So this is what they thought of themselves and they wanted you to make sure that you knew this is who they were when you went to go see their king. Yeah, they, he, he killed people. You can read the, you can look at the slides if you want. Yeah, this is a, th- these are Hebrew soldiers here at the, from, the, from Lachish. This is what Hezekiah's soldiers. You see there's a, a couple people, these people are being impaled. Notice they've got, they're shackled, they've got handcuffs on and their feet are, are, are so they're, they're prisoners. And this is not a very pleasant way of dying, but this is what the Ninevites did, the Assyrians did. We got a, a, a depiction of King Jehu. Jehu's the guy down here bowing down to Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, the, his, whose palace was in Nineveh. 
And this is Jehu offering tribute. So it's really interesting that you can actually see a depiction of some of these peak characters. Like Jehu's a major character in the Bible. He killed a couple of kings and started a new dynasty. Uh, he killed the priest of Baal. Right? We can see him. This is a depiction from a, an artist who was probably there at the time, probably saw him. But, and, and bringing a tribute to them. Yeah. Then here's another scene from Lachish where these are probably some of Hezekiah's officers, their high, his high officials that are having their skin removed from their body while they're alive. And you see, and there's other Hebrews that are going to exile in Assyria walking by. So these people are not very nice. And Jonah knew this was going to happen because Amos had come before and prophesied that Assyria was going to whoop up on Israel. So he had some good reasons why he didn't like them very much. So that's, that's, that, that's it for my review about the archaeology. Neat stuff. I, I talked more about it earlier. So here's what's where the, the main re, uh, touchstone, the reference point for Jonah in the New Testament. So Jesus, then the, some Pharisees and scribes said to him, t- said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Hmm. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with, with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now, I want you to, when you, when you, from now on, whenever you read this statement, read this in Matthew, I want you to think about the men of Nineveh. You know, they just, I went through the slides very, very quickly, but what, you know, would you say that they were really, really nice people or really, really unnice people? I think they're unnice. They're, they're they, Get good, they have good works or bad works? They got bad works, right? But they're going to stand up in judgment because they believed God. They believed the word of the Lord through the prophet Jonah, who was kind of a, a, not that great of a prophet. He wasn't very enthusiastic, now was he? But they believed it and they had life through the belief. You, these guys aren't. So this is the sign of Jonah the prophet. And he, again, a few chapters later in Matthew 16, we have this similar situation. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus. It's not a good idea to test Jesus. He, he passes the tests and makes you te- it takes, it gives you a test. And that Jesus' tests are hard. But anyway, they came up testing Jesus. They asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, When it's evening, you say it will be morning. It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And he left and went away. (laughs) Now, I'm kind of, I like to picture, when I'm reading these narratives, these these dialogues, I like to picture how people were thought about this. And if you're a Pharisee or Sadducee, you ask them this question, and then he said, and Jesus says this and leaves, and you're going, what? But so I'm not sure. I don't think they would have. They they got this. What is the sign of Jonah? I don't know. Let's say find out. Let's find out. So what is the sign of Jonah? What does it mean? Now I think the the, the key here is as Jonah was in the was in the belly of the sea monster, the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. This is what this is the the heart of what Jesus said is a sign of Jonah. So what does it mean to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights? Does anyone, now do you think he's talking about exploring Carlsbad Caverns and having a you know, light on your head and spelunking? No, man, if you're underground for three days, uh, are you going to be feeling too good? No. The answer is you're going to be dead and buried in a tomb. You, know, you, you didn't have people living in caves like that you know, for that long. It's not talking about that. It's uh, death. So we got another question. So what happened to Jonah after being in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights? Does anybody know? He came, back. He came out of the fish. Yeah, in fact, answer, Jonah came out. In fact, the, the, the Bible that says it, he was vomited up. I always like that. I, I, I like the uh, visceral, the, the down-to-earth, the earthy language that's sometimes in the Bible. The fish, blah, you know, split it, spit him up. And he came out onto dry land. 
So what? How now? Now, so there's if, you're, if this is an analogy, it's a, as Jonah did this, so the Son of Man will do that. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, the belly of the fish, sea monster, so Jonah will be. I mean, so Jesus will be three days, three nights in the be, in the heart of the earth. What does that mean? What's he going to do after he's there for three days and three nights? He's coming out. He's going to come out of the earth like Jonah came out of the fish. This is the sign of Jonah. Yes. When Jonah was vomited up out of the belly of the fish, he did, he did not have agency. He did not have a choice in these matters. Seems like uh, uh, it's, if, if Jesus is comparing himself to Jonah in, the, in that case, Jesus himself is saying, I will do what I am commanded to do. So the question was, because I need to get on the microphone, that Jonah did not have a choice or agency in being vomited up from the fish. The, the fish did it, and Jonah had no say in it. So is that not, would that not therefore apply to Jesus, too, that he, what happens to him is not going to be his choice? Huh? I think the thought... His humanity? Yeah. The, the attitude of, I'm like Jonah, is like Jonah was a human being. Jesus was a human being, as well as being God. The humanity of Jesus did what he was told by God himself. Yeah, well, Jesus was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He, is, is, he did his Father's will, not his own will. So, uh, yeah, he definitely obeyed, and it was uh, the Father's will that he be raised from the dead. Uh, whether get, I don't want to get into, into the th theological discussion of did Jesus raise himself from the dead? Was it the Father? Was it the Spirit? We're not told in the Bible the mechanics of that. But, well, I don't, I, I, I don't track with that. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't think we're told about, uh, an analogy does not, as a lot of seminary uh, professors will say, uh, you don't make an analogy walk on all fours. It's, a, it's good for what's relevant. What's, re, uh, what's immediately relevant here is Jonah was in the belly of the, uh, the fish for three days and came out. Jesus is in the belly of the earth for three days and comes out. There, that leads to a, uh, there's another great d discussion about whether Jonah died in the fish, and the only reason anyone ever would qu say that he did is two reasons. One is because he can't conceive of anyone living in a fish for three days and not dying. That's, uh, and second, they, whether, uh, they say that for the analogy here to make sense, Jonah had to die because Jesus died, Jonah had to die. But the narrative of Jonah doesn't say anything about it. If it was an important point, I think it would have been mentioned. Resurrections from the dead are rather spectacular, and with all the miracles that are happening in Jonah, you know, we have, there's a lot of, you know, the storm coming up, the, the fish itself, and the, the plant, and the worm, and the wind, and all, and all that stuff, and the sea calming. Uh, I figured that would have been mentioned if it, would, if it happened, but regardless, the, the, the author of Jonah does not seem to think that's an important point. Anyway, what's, what's being said here is this is the, so is that Jesus is going to be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights and come out of it like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for a similar time, and came out of it alive and did stuff. So what then is the sign of Jonah? The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I, I'm making the three days connection here, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. Come on, man. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. So if there's any doubt, I think that this, you know, the sign of Jonah, three days in the belly of earth here, three, you destroy the, his body, three days he's going to rise up. The sign of Jonah is the resurrection from the dead. This, he's talking about the resurrection. It's a sign. And what was the, and by the way, what was the result of this sign that's in this verse? Does anybody know, can anybody, anybody see it? What did his disciples do as a result of this sign? They believed the scripture. They believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. So as a result of the sign, they remembered, they saw, and they believed. It's the point of signs. So I've got another question for you. What then is the sign of Jonah to which Jesus referred? The answer is resurrection from the dead. Huh. Oh, good. I like side trips. Has anyone ever addressed the reason for three days and three nights? It, it seems significant since it's used both in the shadow event and the real event. 
The question was, is there a significance to the three days and three nights? Answer is, uh, yes, there is. I'm not quite sure what it is, though. That's some, I, it's one of those things I look at, um, I say, I circle in my Bible, I'm like, why? I know there's something there, and I bet you Robbie Dean would tell you. I don't think anybody would ever There's some significance to it. I think that off the top, shooting from the hip, this is something I've thought for, you know, pondered. It, it proves that he's not just mostly dead. Have you ever seen The Princess Bride and The, the Miracle Max? He's not dead. He's only mostly dead, and they, they bring him back. I think it proves that Jesus was not, only, was not just mostly dead. It's kind of like how Jesus waited for Lazarus to be rotting the tomb, and he's smelling. So I, I think it has something to do with that, but there's, I, I feel like there's something more there, but I'm just not quite sure what it is at this point. That there was a Jewish tradition in that time to if, if someone died, you didn't bury them for three days in case they weren't dead. I guess the question was, are, were, were, am I aware there was a Jewish tradition about not burying a person for three days to making sure they were not mostly dead but really dead? Um, well, I know they, I know they buried Jews just pretty pretty dang fast because they wanted to get him in before the Sabbath. So I, I'm not I'm not I know there's a lot of traditions. In fact, I, I've read books about these. Jewish practices, but I know they're not always followed, and I'm not like who practiced it because, as Steve, Stephen Greer said at the conference, Judaism is very diverse. There's a lot of traditions there, and we're and which which group, which one? I mean, even the Jesus days, we had the the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Essenes. Uh, I think I said the Essenes twice. The Herodians. The, so we had all these different groups. So I don't know. It could be could be tied to something like that. I need to do some research before I can give you a good answer. So. Hope that helped. So the sign is the resurrection from the dead. I think, I, I think that's well established. I think we've got to say that. I don't think there's any way around it. And it's a good sign. In fact, as, a, as Christians, as evangelicals, uh, that's the center of everything we do. You know, the happiest day of the year, at least for, as, in Christianity, is what day? Resurrection. Easter, resurrection day, when we celebrate the resurrection from the dead, right? So, and there's a reason for that. So we got now we have a bunch of resurrections in the Bible. I've got nine here. We're going to go through. We're going to talk. And I'm going to talk very briefly about all nine. So the first resurrection we have is in First Kings chapter 17. I just put the chapters. If you want to look them up, the verses you can find fairly easily. Elijah raises the widow of Zarephath's son. We so I'm, and second we have Elisha, Elijah's successor in the Book of Second Kings. He raises the son of the Shunammite. He was raised him from the dead. Then Elisha was so full of the spirit that after he died, they put him in a tomb, and they were burying somebody nearby, and then some raiders showed up, and they threw a body. Of the, the, they wanted to run away, so they threw the body into Elisha's tomb, and when his body touched the bones of Elisha, this man rose from the dead, Second Kings 13. And then we don't have any other resurrections until we get to the New Testament when Jesus raises the, widow, the son of the widow of Nain, which would be... It's in, that's in Galilee in the north. And then Jesus raises the daughter of Jairus in Mark 5. Jesus raises Lazarus, probably the most famous of these. And, and then uh, when, on, upon the crucifixion, when Jesus said it, it's finished and he gave up his spirit and he died, then you know, the, the, there was an earthquake, the veil was ripped, and many saints came out of their tombs to new life. So that happened. And then we had two apostles raise people in the book of Acts. Peter raised uh, Tabitha in Acts 9. And Paul, he preached a long sermon and, let, and bored someone to death. Literally, he fell out the window and died. But Paul raised him from the dead, raised Eutychus. So these are these nine historical resurrections in the Bible. I'm not talking about resurrections yet to come, resurrections that are future. There's one that I'm missing, though. Can anyone, does anyone, can anyone catch which resurrection I'm not, that's not on this list? Jesus. Oh, the big one, the one we all know, right? Yeah, the re there's a reason for that. Good. Hmm? The beast. I, said, I qualified it. He said the beast from Revelation. I qualified this as historical things that have already happened. I'm not counting prophecy because there's, there's a bunch of resurrections of the dead in the future when Jesus comes back. and that. But, uh, but I'm not talking about that right now. But So, uh, yeah, Jesus is the big one. But he's different from all these does anyone, how, how is Jesus' resurrection different from these resurrections? That's a good question. Does anyone have an answer? He never dies. Back, yes, he never dies. See, all these nine people rose from the dead, 
and subsequently died. You're not gonna, we can't bring Eutychus in here as a guest speaker. You're not going to see Lazarus going and voting Republican. He might vote Democrat, but that's a different issue altogether. The, uh, the, the Shunammite, the son, the, the widow of Zarephath's son, they're not walking around. They rose from the dead, they die, and they're rotted. Their bones are moldering somewhere in some grave. Jesus, though, he rose from the dead, and he lives. As you know, stated in Psalm 2, we're going to get to Psalm 2 a little bit later. Uh, when he comes back, he's going to rule the rod of iron and terrify people with his words. He's not, no one's going to lay a finger on him again. You know, the Isaiah 53, 52, 53, suffering servant, the one who was pierced through for our transgressions, was nailed to the cross. Yeah, no one's going to nail him or pierce him through when he comes back, and he's going to live forever. And that's important because, let's see, I'll get to that in a second. Because as Jesus, and Christian theology, why the resurrection is so important, as Jesus lives, so shall we live. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1 that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Now, when you talk about the uh, firstborn or first fruits or uh, you know, the, the firstlings of the flock, what does that imply? There's a strong implication about that. What, what's if you have a firstborn or firstlings or first fruits, what happens next? There's a secondborn, secondlings, the rest of the herd, the rest of the flock, the rest of the, the, the harvest, the rest of the children, right? Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. As Jesus is now, resurrected never to die again, so shall we be. As he lives, so shall we live. Hadn't happened yet. He's the first. He's going to come back and save us from this present evil age. But it hadn't happened yet. So Jesus called this the sign. The sign of Jonah is what I'm going to give you. That's the only sign I'm giving you guys. Now, he gave them a bunch of other signs, but Pharisees weren't looking for that. They weren't looking for the Messiah. They weren't looking for the son of David, the root of Jesse, who's going to cleanse them from their sins and raise them from the dead. But the book of signs, everyone knows what the book of signs is, right? The one that's, that's uh, centered around famously seven signs. Right. Does anyone know what that is? Book of? Revelation? No, not Book of Revelation. No. It's Book of John. I have it up there on the screen. You look at the screen. <laughs> See, I gave you the answer. He's got to look. Okay, so, John is the Book of Signs, and here's the seven signs. I want to go through what the purpose of a sign is. And the most famous signs are here. So, the first, does it, okay, quiz time. What's the first sign that Jesus performed in the Book of John? The way that Cana of Galilee returned water into wine. That's the first of the signs. If you read through that, and it says his disciples were there with him, and they what they what was their result upon seeing this sign that Jesus performed? Does anybody remember? They believed in him. They saw the sign, they believed. Jesus heals the royal official son in, in John 4. Jesus healed the paralytic at Bethesda, the pools where the waters would turn and would get stirred up. He told him to pick up his pallet and walk. Jesus feeds the 5,000 in John chapter 6. You know, the breaking of the bread and the fish and all that. He walked on water. He calmed that sea. He walked on water, calmed the sea. Now, there's, a, there's an analogy there, a connection in Jonah. Because, uh, man, what, what were the seas doing in Jonah? <laughs> they were raging. They weren't too happy. And what happened when, when uh, God told them to stand still? They stood still. What, is, what happens when the, in the Sea of Galilee when the waters are raging and Jesus wants it to stand still? Stand still, there's a connection here. All these signs are pointing to he's the Messiah, he's the promised one, he's the one prophesied from ages past. And the, and the correct response is to listen to him and believe. So the next sign is Jesus restores sight to a man born blind, because nobody had ever heard of that happening before, right? But he does that, he gives sight to the blind, one of those signs of the Messiah. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. We already talked about that a little bit. He was in his grave for a few days and was rotting. They said, don't open up the stone. He's going to smell bad. And then he comes hopping out because he's, he's bound in his, in his rags. He can't really walk. <laughs> he comes on out, and everyone's happy to see him alive. And there's an eighth sign. It's not called a sign, but there's a, it's the center point of the book. Jesus rises from the dead. And Jesus is doing all of this. You know, I put him as a subject of everything. He rose from the dead. That's what's the celebration. It's John chapter 20. So these are the signs. Now, what do you do with these signs? 
Here's what John said you're supposed to do with these signs in John chapter 20. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Don't have time to write everything, right? But these, these seven, these eight signs have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Is it wrong to believe because of a sign? There's been, taught, there's been some modern Christian teachers teach that you need to have faith, and a sign means you, if you have a sign, it means you don't have faith. Is that, is, that a good, is that a good idea? Is that a good interpretation of the Bible? Why were his disciples believing in him? What does John want you to do with these signs that he wrote about, that John witnessed and John believed on the basis of these signs, that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the one from promise from ages past? What should we do when we read about these signs and see how they relate to the Old Testament and the prophecies? What's the answer? Anyone know what we should do? Yeah, believe. Believe in him. Believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the root of, Bre- the root of David, the, Bre- the stump of Jesse, all, all those titles. So what did this sh- sign show about Jesus? Now this is Paul in Romans 1, and he, he says, who is Jesus, the Son of God? I, there's a longer quote. I don't want to get into Paul's long sentences in Romans right now, so I'm cutting them off a bit. He says, Jesus, who was declared the Son of God with power, by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's a couple places before the resurrection where God, Jesus was declared by the Father to be the Son of God. There's two in particular. Does anybody know what the two, two places he was called the Son of God before that were? Where the, vo- the, the clouds parted, voice came from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him. Happened twice. The baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist when the spirit, of, the spirit came down as a dove and the and, and the Father spoke from heaven. And the second time was at the Mount of Transfigurance. Transfiguration. But Paul said, said he wasn't declared to be the Son of God at his bap- baptism or at the Transfiguration. Well, he says he was declared with power from the, uh, at the resurrection. See, this is, the, this is the great sign that proves that Jesus is the Son of God. This is what Paul, at least what Paul believes, what Paul writes. And I think Paul's a pretty good theologian that I ought to take take seriously. So, let's see. And what does this mean for us? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we who have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. See, our eternal life, our resurrection from the dead, is tied to Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. If Jesus, this is what Paul, Paul writes in Romans, I mean, not Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There's a discussion about resurrection from the dead, and, it, and it's hard to believe. We've never seen one raised from the dead. We don't believe that was raised from the dead. Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead. And Paul says, man, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, we're out, we don't have any hope. We got nothing. We are most among men to be pitied. Because resurrection from the dead, Jesus' resurrection, is, is the linchpin the cornerstone of all of our hope is what get, is what our hope for the future that gives it lets us keep moving. It's the hope that for those that have what we've lost. It's our hope for it from it's a, been the hope from Abraham when he believed in the resurrection of the dead of Isaac. It's the hope of Job when he says, "I know that my redeemer lives, and in the last days I'll see him though my, uh, my with my eyes." And it's the hope of us today this resurrection that we will be raised from the dead as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. So. Now, where's this whole son? Now, Paul links son of God. He was declared to be the son of God through the resurrection of the dead. Where is where's the son of God come from? I mean, where is this title from? How do you know that the Messiah, the Mashiach, is going to be the son of God? Well, let's go look at it. You can turn your Bible to Psalm 2. Stephen Gare talked about this psalm pretty, uh, quite a bit. There's two psalms that are quoted more in the New Testament than anything else. They are Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is the one that starts, the, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for my feet. So, and that goes through. That's a great psalm. But we're going to look at Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar 
and the people's devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah, his anointed, saying, Let us tear apart their fetters from us. Let us cast away their cords. But he who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He mocks them. Then, after mocking them and laughing at them, he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and fear and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he may not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm of David. So, this is a one of the most quoted psalms. The key verse here is Psalm 2.7. He said, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, what's the most, fam- now, what's the most famous quotation or reference to this verse in the whole Bible? Is it, anybody know? My only begotten son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, John 3.16. Yes, this is where the idea of son being begotten of God and being the son of God is. This is that reference. And Paul makes that reference in Acts chapter 4. He was declared to be the son of God by power, be this one from Psalm 2. Now, what's this one from Psalm 2 going to do? Now, has Psalm 2 been fulfilled? Have you you seen Jesus shattering people like earthenware and terrifying people with his words? You haven't seen that yet, have you? That's, that's a preview of coming attractions. That was, that's what we pray for when we say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Save us from this present evil age. That's what we're wanting him to come do. He hadn't done that yet. But this is but Psalm 2, if you want to know, it's really neat to kind of track this through the Bible. It's, it's quoted so much. The Bible builds on itself. Stephen Gare did a lot of that in this uh, conference. Amazing work. You, go, you should go listen to him too. He's pretty good. So, so ultimately, what is our... Oh, yeah, and uh, let's, talk, let's talk Acts 13. Paul has a wonderful, wonderful uh, message in, in Acts. He's in Antioch of Pisidia in modern-day Turkey, kind of central Turkey area, and he walks into the synagogue, and they open up the Torah, the Law and the Prophets, and they read, and they sit down, and they start to have this discussion. It's similar to how Jesus read, you know, opened up the, the said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, you know, the, and you know, read from Isaiah 63. And then, and then he had that said this this, this uh, has been fulfilled in your hearing today. It's something similar is going on here. They sit down. They have they're having their discussion, and Paul claims, and then Paul in verse sixteen of chapter thirteen, he stood up and motioning with his hand. I think this is probably Beto's favorite verse in the Bible. Motioning with his hand. No, but he stood up. He motioned with his hand. Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. Man, there's some great speeches in the Bible. I, I found my, I was reading this earlier, you know, and my, Rebecca was like, is that a recording of you, or are you actually reading this? No, but you've got to, I think you've got to read these with a good, you know, try to speak them well, not speak them boringly. But the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm, he led them from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. Book of Numbers. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. Man, he's cutting through history pretty fast, isn't he? After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then, because he didn't have a prophet from from the time of Moses until Samuel. Samuel was special, prophet, priest, and judge. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul of Kish, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After he had removed him, he, God, raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he had also testified and said, I have found David. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to a promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, 
Now, quiz time. What promise was it that God made with David that the, the, the Savior would come through David? Robbie's been talking about it. You should get it. What is it? The Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the promise that he's talking about. Paul likes his Old Testament a lot, doesn't he? From the, let's see, verse 24. After this, after John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose, who, uh, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie or to tie. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God. So this is Jews and all these Gentiles who fear our God, fear the God of Israel. To us, the, us apostles, the message of this salvation has been sent for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, which we just read, fulfilled by these the condemning him. So he said, the rulers of Israel, they know the prophets, they read them every day, they don't understand them, they're not looking for them, and they didn't follow him, they didn't follow Jesus, they didn't recognize him, and by not recognizing him and putting him to death, they fulfilled the prophecies, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. And, through, and though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate to be, uh, that he be executed. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared with those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. By the way, I've seen this guy. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled his promise to our children, and that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. Jesus didn't rot. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. He didn't rot. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him everyone who believes is freed from all, from all things, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. You're free through Christ. Therefore, take heed so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. From Habakkuk chapter 1, Behold, you scoffers and marvel. You, behold, you scoffers and marvel and perish. For I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which will never, you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. Now, is Paul describing this to them? Yes. You better believe. You don't want this prophecy to be about you guys. It's been about them, but it's really it's bad when it's about those guys. It's worse when it's about you guys. So as and if Paul and Barmas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them on the next Sabbath. So, and he, and he goes on, but he's teaching the gospel here. This is Jesus. This is the one from, he's arguing that Jesus is the promised one, the Messiah, the one that was promised from ages past, the, 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 the descendant of David, the king of Israel. And you should believe on him and have life. This is exactly what Stephen Gare was talking about. When the, the early gospel, the, the, early, the people were going out and teach, preaching Jesus, they were saying, hey, look, here's the Old Testament. This is, this is Jesus guy. He's the one from the, he's the, fulfills all these prophecies. He's the one we need to believe. He's the savior of Israel. He's the one that was promised to, in, you know, the Davidic covenant. He's the one talking about Psalm 2. Other ones talking about, he's the guy in Psalm 110. That's what Jesus said of himself. So this is what is, uh, this resurrection, this uh, son of God language, Psalm 2, is explicitly tied to the sign of Jonah. It's tied to Jesus' resurrection. It's the center of the gospel. It's the center of Christianity. It's the center of who we are and what our faith is and what we do. If we go out and try to share the gospel, uh, we, we, what, the center of the gospel is Christ's death and resurrection for us. And this is what, what Paul is preaching. And furthermore, not only is it, did he just do this, it was God called a shot. Have any of you ever seen uh, The Sandlot? The baseball movie, or heard of Babe Ruth. Most people have heard of Babe Ruth. Most famous thing that Babe Ruth ever did is he was sitting there at the plate, 
And when and he let two strikes go by, and he put his bat and he pointed to center field. The bay was calling his shot. And then he had a towering home run and, and crushed it out of the park. And according to the narrator of the Sandlot, that's the moment he went from being a hero to becoming a legend. Now, God does something similar. It's actually greater than what the babe did. He calls his shots from the beginning. If you follow the prophecies from Genesis 3.15 to the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, to the Genesis 49, uh, the, the blessings of Jacob upon his sons, you know, this coming, the, son, the, the Messiah is coming through Judah, 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant. And you got Isaiah 7.14, going to be born of a virgin. Micah 5.2, going to be born in Bethlehem. I mean, there, Isaiah 53, the, the servant psalms, there's so much I'm skipping over. Isaiah 9, he's going to live in the, in, the, in the land of darkness, darkness of the shadow of death, and Naphtali, and Zebulun, in the north, and Galilee, a light shining in the darkness. All these things Jesus fulfilled. And, he, and, and they, these were all hundreds of years, if not thousands of years beforehand. God calls a shot. And, man, and when you see this, these are signs that Jesus is doing all these things. The response to these signs is to believe. And the result of belief is life and resurrection from the dead at the end of the age. So how this ultimately applies to us. There is one ultimate problem we have, and that's death. Paul writes in, the, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he later on talks about the rapture, I'm not going to get into that right now. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, those who are dead, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. By the way, who has no hope in here? Because he's talking about the rest who have no hope. He's talking about Christians? No, he's talking about those pagans, those guys that are worshiping Zeus and, and, Zeus and Hera and Poseidon and... Jupiter and Venus, you know, the various Roman and Greek gods, and Baal and Marduk and all those other gods. They don't have a resurrection from the dead. They don't have any hope. We don't mourn like those who have no hope. We do mourn. But for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Christ and Jesus. So this is our hope. I mean, all of us have encountered death at one point or another, and it's, this is pretty universal, isn't it? You can't live in this world and escape it. Ever since the Garden of Eden, ever since Adam and Eve, all people have died. The death rate's one per person. And we all have to deal with this. Now, I'm talking about the earlier resurrections. I had a professor in seminary. Some professors like, like to call these resuscitations, which I don't like that term because resuscitation uh, you know, makes it feel like it's, they weren't really dead. That they, You kind of get them out of the water, you, you, you pump their, their chest, and the, and the water spurts out, and you get them breathing again. But these guys, in the, in the, these nine that I showed in that earlier list, were actually dead. But they need to separate that from the resurrection of Christ. They're two different things. I had one, one Bible exposition professor who said he liked to call them resurrections, which I thought they sounded like a Viagra commercial. But anyway, so, but this is different. And our, our, how many of us would give everything we own, everything we have, every, all of our self, to get like a resurrection of Lazarus? That... We have a, a you can think of yourself, you don't need to say anything, but think of your, yourself, your family, your loved ones, and how much would you give to see them walk out of the tomb? They're not smelling anymore, they're kind of hopping because they, they're in that, that, that burial clothes, you know, but they come out and they see you. I mean, we give everything we have, a lot of people give everything they have just to see that, but you know that he'd die again, right? How much more valuable is the eternal life, the resurrection of the dead that Jesus is going to bring on us? This is our hope, this is the center of our gospel, and this is all that we have. We have nothing else besides the, the hope of resurrection, hope of Jesus coming. He's, going to, he's the one, it's Jesus, who's going to save us from this present evil age. This is, he is the one that, that John writes at the very end of the Bible, the last words of the Bible. Those who have this hope fixed on you, Jesus, say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Because you're our hope, you're our salvation, and you, your death, burial, and resurrection is what we proclaim. This is what Paul's talking about in Acts chapter 13. This is what Paul's talking about in all the epistles. You know, he relates it to that, and he, and he says it's coming from the Old Testament. This is how you live. This is what we do. This is the gospel. This, we are evangelicals. We're people of the gospel. This, the gospel is here. This is the heart of it. It's the resurrection from the dead. Now, so we're, uh, we're, I'm, gonna, I'm getting to my conclusion. I'm gonna, about to wrap this up, but we'll have a couple minutes of questions if I do this right. So... One, other, I love, one of the things I love about Acts is he's got these long dialogues. I, personally, my favorite literature is narrative literature. I love reading stories. 
And Acts is a story. It tells these characters, they're moving around, and tells them these speeches. Oh, man, they give good speeches. And it's not just like, it doesn't just tickle the ears. There's real content there. It's extremely logical. It references, it makes a strong case in the Old Testament. I love it. But, you know, Jesus, not Jesus, Paul, Peter, in his, in, the, in his famous Acts 2 lesson, said at the, his climax is, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, what, what's going on in Acts 2? There's one big event that's happening in Acts 2. What's, what's going, what happened in Acts 2? The day of Pentecost, yes. And the Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came upon the church. So the Holy Spirit came upon the church, uh, all these people started speaking in different languages, each from their own different place. Well, Robbie's taught about this. And there's people, f- folks are looking around going, what's going on? Are they drunk? It's too early in the day for them to be drunk. And Peter s- stands up and gives this great le- lecture, this great sermon, and it, it results in 3,000 people being converted to Christianity. They're like, you know what? You're right. What's going on? He, g- he stands up and says, this is not people being drunk. This is the Holy Spirit coming upon you that was, pro- that was prophesied in the past. That's what he quotes Amos, and he quotes Joel. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. You know, they can't be drunk before noon, right? Well, sometimes you can, but that's a bad life, a bad way to live. And he goes through, he quotes some, uh, some Joel, says that there's going to be the, that your sons and daughters will prophesy. And he says in verse 22 of chapter 2, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles, and with wonders and with signs, hmm, it's tested with signs. I wonder what you're supposed to do with a sign, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by, by the hands of godless men to put him to death. Kind of in your face, you guys did it. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death so that it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh will also live in hope. He lives in hope because of Messiah. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence." Brethren, as Peter just speaking now, brethren, I, confident, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried in his tomb and is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn to him an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. What's that oath again, guys? The Davidic what? Covenant. And where is that found? 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant. Man, there's twice in the book of Acts they're referencing this. Seems like it's kind of important, doesn't it? He looked, verse 31, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this, which you both now see and hear, this Holy Spirit's calling us to talk like this. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, Psalm 110, The Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh said to Adonai, My Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now then, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? So they're hearing this. They hear these signs, and what do they do? They believe. Peter said to them, Repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I've got a question for you. Why did Peter say they needed to repent to receive the Holy Spirit? That's normally not what we tell in our gospel presentations, is it? No. Now, for an answer, I've got a really good answer for this. Come back on Tuesday. That's my, that's my topic next time, is repentance. And repentance in the book of Jonah. I'll be, I'll be spending more time in Jonah because 
There's a lot of people that repent in Jonah, and we'll talk about that and what repentance means for us. We have about three or four minutes before my time is up, so do we have, what are your questions? Does anyone have any more questions? I've, I've, liked, I've had a lively audience today. This is good. No? Okay. Well, that's good. We had a good, I, I think had a good class. I'm, I'm having a good time. I hope you did too. So we're going to pray and get out of here and have a good night. Father in heaven, I thank you for your wonderful grace and your the blessings you give us for the gift of your son who gives us life from the dead. You rose from the dead, fulfilling all the prophecies, and you give us hope for a better life, for eternal life, that we'll see the loved ones we miss, and then we'll, and they'll never suffer decay and never suffer loss or cancer or suffering and sadness again. I pray you'll help us with our walk, that we will be ministers of the gospel. We will live life in light of your son who gave himself for us and live life accordingly. Pray for our pastor once again. Bring him back safely. Bless his teaching and his, uh, his expedition. Be with our country. Help them to make wise decisions and lead our country w- with wisdom. And let us all always look forward to your son's return, for he alone is our hope. In the name of your son, Christ Jesus, amen.